Hello, everyone. Hello. Um, I have a pleasure to welcome you to our last uh, presentation of the uh, of the conference. Our speaker, Jacek Krewowski, uh, is an astrophysicist. He is a recipient of many rewards and scholarships, including Rockefeller and Fulbright Scholarship, Maria Curie Grants, and Dr. Honoris Causa, and holds uh, uh, the awards from Polish Ministry of Science. He is a member of multiple Polish and foreign uh, scientific societies and can currently lectures at the University of Rzeszów. Welcome, Jacku, and uh, the floor is yours. Welcome, everybody. <laughs> it's a bit strange to speak to you, not seeing any of you. But anyway, we have to learn every year something this year, especially because of this pandemic, which made very popular online meetings. Uh, so anyway, as, uh, as you see, this lecture will be about absorption spectra of interstellar clouds. I will try to explain why this is important also during the meeting like this. So first of all, seemingly everything started from the observation of something like this, when William Herschel, by the end of 18th century, looked into the sky through one of his famous telescopes and cried, oh my goodness, here is a hole in the sky. Of course, it was not a hole, exactly. Uh, if to observe this in another wavelength range, I mean in infrared, then we see that it is just some extinction caused apparently by dust grains. Why by dust grains? Because the interstellar medium, as we observe here, a sort of interstellar cloud, is in fact of very, very low density. The density of this medium is much lower than that in a very good laboratory vacuum. Of course, gas of such density must not produce any continuous uh, opacity, must pro can produce only lines. So if we see continuous extinction, it must be produced by something like smoke. So the dust particles inside the gas environment. As a matter of fact, this, there are many such dark clouds in our Milky Way. And what is funny, that very first observations documented of such dark spots were made by the Incas many, many centuries ago. And in particular, you see that this is a Milky Way on the, from the Southern Hemisphere, because we observe here the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is not observable from our Northern Hemisphere. In particular, this black dot here is called the Fox by Incas. Don't ask me why. But why not to show you the fox which posed for this dark spot? It is this one. It is a fox being a <laughs> sort of toy uh, at, the observ at the European Southern Observatory in Chile. Uh, and in fact, uh, just right to me, somewhere here, is a house for observers and uh, the fox is usually present in the vicinity of this house because usually everybody comes with some food for him. That's all. But okay, uh, more seriously, if we observe something in the space, we can see the source of light, some star usually, which produces continuous spectrum. This may shine through some interstellar cloud and then we observe dark absorption lines in this continuous spectrum. Or we can observe this cloud from a side and inside of dark lines, we see the same lines as bright ones. For us right now, interesting in this case, 
from the right, dark lines on the background of continuous spectrum. And this is the very first, very first uh, interstellar line observed in 1904 by Hartmann. Uh, not, not this is because it is called H, because the name is from Fraunhofer from the beginning of 19th century. But what is interesting, first, we see this line as very narrow and stationary, while aside we have this hydrogen stellar line, which is not stationary, it moves back and forth, and is also much broader. Uh, as you see, these are two spectra of the same star at two different epochs, and the star is a so-called spectroscopic binary. So if something is moving back and forth, these are apparently stellar lines, because these are two stars which circulate around the same gravity center, but the interstellar line is formed along the sight line. Another interesting feature is that such lines, in this case it is not the ionized calcium line, but a neutral sodium line in the ultraviolet, we see that in one case we see uh, the interstellar lines evidently split it. In one, there is no splitting. So this splitting is also caused by the Doppler effect. So I mean, there are apparently more than one cloud along the line of sight, and these two or more clouds are of different radial velocities, uh, radial velocities, so I mean along the sideline. And very interesting phenomenon, which was proved many years ago actually, is that in the interstellar gas, we observe these so-called depletions of uh, heavy elements. That means that many heavy elements, especially from this side, uh, are of much lower abundances than in the sun. This horizontal line is a solar abundance, but here we have much less abundant elements, especially that the scale of depletions is a logarithmic one, so apparently calcium is 4,000 times less abundant than in the sun. Titanium is about a thousand and so on. So that's really interesting phenomenon, which is observed in the interstellar medium. Uh, moreover, the interstellar medium could be very diverse. What we observe here, it is the same star as before, you see 90177, uh, and of course, uh, sorry, these uh, elements are written in Polish, but these, of course, potassium, sodium, iron, and calcium. What is interested, interesting, that we see these sodium and potassium lines almost identical, identically split by the Doppler effect. But despite of this, we see that the main line of iron is at completely different radial velocity. Interesting, and the same a cloud is related to uh, calcium lines. So we call such objects cafe clouds, at least it sounds very tasty, why not? But apparently there are very different clouds in the interstellar medium. Uh, there is a possibility of observing some interstellar features towards uh, different galaxies, in this case this is the Milky Way here, and Large Magellanic Cloud far away at large radial velocities. So apparently the same or similar interstellar medium can be observed also in other than our Milky Way 
galaxies. And something else. This very sharp needle here in two spectra of the same star, the same as before actually, at two different epochs, is the line of the interstellar CH molecule, the first one discovered in the history, namely in 1937. It is apparently also a very stationary feature, while stellar lines are moving back and forth because of the Doppler movement. <clears throat> this feature is in fact the doublet, but we can see the doublet only in extremely high resolution. Uh, in this particular case, there are two spectra with a resolution uh, half a million, and these are probably the only two spectra recorded with such a resolution. But anyway, it is a kind of doublet. Uh, what is also interesting, when at least I was a student, I was learned that uh, uh, if some spectral feature is correlated to color excess, in this case to EB minus V, it is interstellar. Uh, in this picture, we see that um, the correlation between the color excess and the strengths of in this case, CH features is really very poor. So it is not that simple. Also, we can see very rich Doppler structures in the profile of ionized calcium lines, this green line, where we can observe 10 Doppler components, while in the molecular line, we can barely see two components, one relatively strong and one very weak. So apparently different interstellar clouds are of different physical parameters. And also CH could be observed in other galaxies. This is a galaxy named 100 in the Messier catalog and apparently we see CH line with a very high radial velocity over 1,600 kilometers. Another molecule is CH+, plus, and it is not just the result of ionization of CH, it is formed in another way. Uh, but what is interesting is that in a close vicinity of this strong feature, we can observe the weak one with a heavy isotope of CH+. Plus. And this is interesting because it is, of course, int uh, interesting for us. What is the ratio of C12 to C13? It is, in fact, about 80. CH and CH, CH, and CH plus, as I said, is there are two different molecules. And in this particular case, in the spectra of very good spectrograph, Espresso from European Southern Observatory, they show completely different radial velocities. This is a plot which proves that in individual clouds, the individual spectra could be really different. In this spectrum, we observe a relatively strong neutral calcium line, which is practically absent in this green spectrum. So, if we have several clouds along one line of sight, we observe a, sor a sort of ill-defined average. And uh, uh, some part of spectrum where we can observe many molecular features because we observe here CN band and another CH, also iron line. Uh, as you see, stellar lines look completely different in these two spectra of this spectroscopic binary. Also, we can see that the ratio, strength ratio of CH to CN, the neighbor bands, could be completely different from object to object. So once again, we see that individual clouds could be 
of different spectra, so of different physical parameters. Also in CN molecule, we see uh, these are these strong features which are not now uh, seen only partially, but we see the C13 N band which is available also in CN. Uh, it is interesting that CN is observed from 1940 in this form, so one relatively strong features and two weaker, and these two weaker features are, as we know, from the first rotationally excited level, and it was found on, even in 1940 by Andrew McKellar that this proves that, as he understood, temperature of interstellar space is about 2.7 degree, but in 1965, Penzias and Wilson find the cosmic background radiation with a temperature about 3 Kelvin and received the Nobel Prize for this. So this was the, uh, this was the discovery of the cosmic background radiation, which excites the CN molecule. Uh, CN molecule is also poorly correlated with EV minus V, with color excess. We have EV minus V is here, and the CN band, as you see, is completely not related simply to EV minus V. Uh, what is interesting, it is, uh, it was rather, in 1973, I was for a, a summer school in Castello di Miramare near Trieste in Italy, and one day it was announced that Paul Dirac is coming with a lecture. Of course, it was a legend of uh, 20th century physics, so I attended the lecture, and the lecture was about the strange phenomenon that if to make some products using basic uh, constants of physics, we get simple natural numbers. And look here, if we take Boltzmann equation in this form, if we take the basic constants as precise as one can the, find them in the web, then this is the wavelength of this transition between grand level of CN and the first rotationally excited. And this is a temperature of uh, cosmic background radiation dedicated satellites. We get something like this. So practically it's two. So once again, simple natural uh, number. Uh, of course, uh, Dirac did not know what does it mean, and I don't know either. But it is not the final interesting thing about CN, because if to correlate unsaturated R0 and R1 transitions, instead of line, so the ratio should be 3.7. In fact, the ratio is, is a pi number. Could you imagine? Looks like that this pi number can be determined sometimes empirically. Of course, the, there are a couple of uh, cases here. These are the cases of higher uh, rotational temperature than this 2.7 or 3 Kelvin. <clears throat> but with uh, this ratio of pi, the rotational temperature is a quarter of Kelvin higher than the temperature of cosmic background radiation. Uh, also, nobody knows why this is so. Uh, this shows the actually largest uh, molecule observable in interstellar clouds uh, is just C3. And what we can observe is that apparently the growing band head, which says that uh, the rotational temperature of these 
centrosymmetric molecule is really growing. Also with C3, we see that the individual transitions are much closer each other than its simple two-atom radicals. And uh, this can be observed as well in small Magellanic cloud. Uh, there is a sort of plot which at uh, purely astronomical meetings usually causes love uh, because it really looks funny. There are just, just a few of elements listed here. The reason is very simple. Uh, namely, these are, sorry, uh, no, no, no. these are the only elements which are abundant enough that their molecules containing such atoms can be observable. So you see especially very important CNO group. And we come to something else, to the problem of so-called diffuse interstellar bands. And in this plot taken from Peter Yeniskens and Francois Desert, we can observe quite a lot of spectral features. Everything started actually from only two features and from this very publication from League Observatory by Miss Mary Lee Hager. And these are these two features which lack the identification as you see. So, 100 years ago, there were two such features known as diffuse interstellar bands. Right now, we may have 562. However, my American friends, Ben McCall and Elizabeth Griffin, dug in the uh, photographic plates of League Observatory and found the original plates where the diffuse bands, these two, were found. It was a bit more than the observations made a bit more than 100 years ago. And, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> the same wavelength range with very modern, very high resol resolution and high signal to the spectra. And uh, you see all these vertical lines show individual diffuse bands. Naturally, a vast majority of them are very narrow and very shallow features. But instead of two, we observe about 30 diffuse bands in this range. Why they are diffuse and why interstellar? This is once again more or less the same wavelength range, a bit broader, because now we have five spectra of the same spectroscopic binary, night by night. We see here the sodium doublet, very narrow, very sharp, and very stationary spectral line, as you see. Here we see stellar helium with a Doppler dance. Here we see the iron, where we see silicon. All of them are performing the Doppler dance. They are non-stationary, stellar. But here we observe three spectral features, which are apparently stationary. So they are interstellar, but their profiles are apparently broader than those of, say, very strong sodium lines, and that's why they are diffuse. So that's why the name. And what concerns their properties? This is the possible very different strength ratio of the first two observed diffuse bands. So 5780 and 5797. So it is my very first uh, quite important observational result together with my Swedish friend Bengt Westerlund almost 40 years ago. Also, we observed the Doppler splitting in diffuse bands. So we have some specific star is a catalog number. Here we have the molecular lines, 
with evident Doppler splitting, atomic lines with evident Doppler splitting, the same molecular line here, this blue one, and for reasonably narrow diffuse bands which show the same Doppler splitting. So apparently they could be formed, I mean their profiles, in several clouds along the line of sight. And something like this is a very new result. Uh, there are two stars. You see their catalog numbers here. What is interesting is that they can, if they are moved to the same zero radial velocity uh, frame, then we see the same velocity of sodium, exactly the same of potassium. In fact, it's the same of CH, but I have not uh, normalized the, this blue line to the same depth. So you see how weak it is, but it's also exactly like this, they cover each other. But the diffuse band is of apparently different shape and is apparently in this blue spectrum it's moved redward. This is something new, and I will say a, a few words about this later. What is interesting, this spectra were taken from this very observatory. What is interesting in this observatory, this is, ladies and gentlemen, La Palma Island, very famous during the last two weeks or so. Uh, I received yesterday an email from my Swedish friend uh, being responsible for one of the telescopes of this observatory, or the so-called Nordic Optical Telescope, that despite the eruption, the observatory remains intact. Thanks, God. The same effect could be observed, however, in some other spectral features, uh, in other diffuse bands. The only problem is that these observations were made using another spectrograph, which covers only very narrow range of spectra, and uh, it is not uh, possible to move the whole spectrum to the rest wave and velocity frame, so it is only possible to compare profile shapes. But we see that profile shape of potassium line is exactly the same, no Doppler splitting. So this kind of broadening is also not a Doppler splitting. And the same more or less concerns this band, which is very nice because it shows very rich substructure pattern. But look, the ratios of the strengths of these substructures are completely different, so they change also from object to object. Uh, of course, it was one very first idea that, uh, well, if we have uh, many diffuse bands, so it would be nice to find some sets or subsets of diffuse bands which are originated in the same carriers, uh, and this was done by means of correlating intensities of uh, many pairs of diffuse bands. However, the result is strange. Even with such a tight correlation, like in this case, the diffuse bands can be proved not to be of the same origin. That's, that's a big problem right now. Uh, so coming back to different profiles, there are these different profiles which are uh, shown for the same two diffuse bands that are correlated here. And uh, you can see that really the profiles change. Some of them are narrower, some of them are broader. Uh, if to do the correlation like this, the central wavelength and full width at half maximum. 
then we can get something like this for three out of four diffuse bands because for this we can get nothing these red circles are the objects from this former slide so it is, it is this one now you see it's more or less the same effect so this effect is really brand new uh, so there, there is a good question why there are some shifts and some broadenings of diffuse bands and let me demonstrate a very specific object because there is only one such object called Herschel 36 in the sky and this is the only object in which we can see the transitions of CH plus and CH from the first rotationally excited level which indicates for the rotational temperature you see almost 14 Kelvin so that means very hot for the interstellar medium because normally it's below 3 Kelvin as, as I demonstrated earlier so it's a very very specific object why it's so interesting for us because in this object we observe very broad and red shifted diffuse bands so apparently this phenomenon seems related to rotational temperature of the diffuse band carriers and this is a very interesting phenomenon in fact if we estimate the rotational temperature of H2 molecule if it is relatively low because you see it might maybe much higher so it is if it is relatively low at least it's easily seen for this diffuse band 5797 it is relatively narrow with higher temperatures it's much broader so most likely diffuse bands are created in some centrosymmetric molecules reasonably complicated this is really of specific importance because the carriers of diffuse interstellar bands remain unidentified since practically 100 years so it is the longest standing and solved problem in all of spectroscopy however we still do not know what is this what are the carriers of diffuse bands uh, why do we think these are molecules because the atomic spectra are reasonably well known so it hardly could be atomic spectrum the same concerns simple two atom radicals like CH of CN and similar because these spectra are also well known and the spectral features are very narrow what's another possibility dust particles it was the idea like this however now we know that spectral features originating in dust particles uh, must have a specific shape of profiles until the spectra were very noisy so i mean until photographic plates were used to record spectra it seemed okay however having high signal to noise spectra we cannot uh, pretend we don't see real shapes of diffuse band profiles so what is left just some complex molecules there is no other choice but we still don't know what they are uh, so uh, they the profiles are very likely caused by some complex molecules very likely uh, of uh, centrosymmetric uh, yeah and the spectra or profiles of diffuse bands may change because of some unknown to us variations of physical parameters of intervening clouds 
Also, the broadened profiles are red shifted. Broader profile is also a bit more red shifted. Interesting. Identification requires very high resolution to be sure that the observed profile is not Doppler splitted and very high signal to noise ratio as most of DIPs are very weak features and their reliable measurements require a very high signal to noise. Uh, of course, dust formation causes depletions of many elements, but uh, only the most abundant elements may form the observable molecules. And uh, how to relate this uh, astronomical uh, material to the problem of interest of uh, life in the space. Uh, so, what's the history of the universe? Uh, this is just in in few words, and also I as added some something in Polish. As you may know, the original idea was to help this. Uh, uh, who uh, speech in Polish, uh, finally we decided that English is still better, but at least a few sentences could be left in Polish. So everything started from so-called Big Bang, and during an extremely short period, the universe was filled with only photons. Uh, and now, now just few sentences in Polish. Ci z Państwa, którzy rozumieją następne zdanie, wiedzą, że był, zostało ono napisane w 1832 roku w Dreźnie. W połowie XX wieku zawodowi kosmologowie napisali właściwie to samo. Czyli całkiem wydaje się możliwe, że wielki pan Adam miał jakieś kontakty niedostępne dla zwykłego śmiertelnika. And coming back to English. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, in this very young universe, uh, photon met another photon and of course, despite many uh, details, elementary particles have been formed. From the meeting of elementary particles, some very preliminary atoms have been formed. Then stars, first stars were formed, and atoms met each other in stellar course, producing next more heavy elements, in particular carbon, the so-called life element and the stars were disrupted because of evolution and formed the interstellar medium. Then in the interstellar medium atoms met each other forming molecules, in particular organic ones, And then out of this material, uh, stars are formed with planetary systems, but this is right now more something like we heard in another, uh, in another speeches, so I will not continue in this way. These two points are more or less astronomical. And uh, and this point, this lecture by Sarah Walker could have started like it was uh, since everything started to be on the terrestrial surface, but it is, it is something else. Because so many things happened because of meetings. Let's drink for the meeting. Zaspotkanie. Cheers. That's all. Thank you so much, Jacek. 
Uh, this was an interesting lecture in astronomy, reminding us that mostly biologists uh, of the space context of our discipline. And there is a reason why there is a world word astro in astrobiology. So it was beautiful to hear what, what you had, what you just presented. And I have a question. Uh, would it be possible to see the same, using the same methods that uh, were used to observe CH and you said the biggest molecule was C3? Would it be possible to see even bigger molecules or is it a limitation of a telescope itself? Uh, no, maybe it's, uh, it's a bit complicated answer. So what concerns big molecules, they are observed, in fact, in star forming regions. So where the stars with planetary systems were formed, certainly there are seen many, uh, some of them very complex molecules. That's true. However, uh, the problem is that we observe a couple of very simple molecules in general interstellar medium, plus the carriers of diffuse bands, which are present everywhere. So apparently these carriers are very resistant to very harsh uh, physical conditions in the interstellar clouds, but they must play some role in formation of uh, maybe prebiotic molecules or something like this. If the, a star with planets is formed, then certainly there are some, uh, some really complex molecules in these uh, beings, in, in the young planets and comets, in whatever is formed for such an occasion. It's strange, in fact. And we, we know nothing about this. Right. Um, maybe I didn't catch it. What is the origin of interstellar cloud? Ah, the origin. So, in fact, it is that uh, the galaxy as a whole is like one living organism. So, the point is, there is a interstellar medium which is divided into clouds. Uh, in certain conditions, the clouds are getting denser and they form stars or uh, more likely uh, some uh, groups of stars. Then, of course, uh, and, however, before there is a lot of dense material, so there are some molecules there. There is a, something very complicated. Then there are some new elements formed inside the formed stars the stars are getting disrupted, once again fall into the interstellar medium, and so on. So it is like one living organism. It is very difficult to... Uh, and, well, without this, it would be no life in the, in the uh, space at all, because, uh, as I mentioned, these key elements, like carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, are formed, in fact, in, uh, in uh, massive stars. Uh, so without disruption of these stars, uh, without interstellar medium and once again formation of stars, no life would be possible. Absolutely. That uh, reminds me of the context of habitability of the whole galaxy, right? Oh, yeah. And uh, I have a question about the telescopes, because the telescopes you mentioned in the talk, they're mostly or only ground-based. And I wonder if there would be any advantage to have a, a space telescope, or is there any that... that uh, well, there is, the there is a sort of advantage of observing from space. So, of course, you know the, that the, the so-called Hubble Space Telescope is uh, working continuously, I think, for a quarter of a century. Uh, but, of course, there are still observations from the Earth, from the ground-based observatories. The problem is that uh, usually if you uh, launch some um, apparatus uh, to the orbit, then usually the technology of the moment of launch is a bit old-fashioned. So the 
uh, really new technology is that one in the ground base observatories. So that's okay. the problem. Of course, as, as the old man, I remember times where the existing uh, observing facilities were totally different from the current ones. Yeah, but of course, yeah. it would be a very long story. Um, so. As much as I know about the telescope, the uh, adjustable mirrors are the revolution right now that, that helps. Well, there are, of course, new technologies because of the, uh, what I remember from my very young age was that uh, if it was uh, the idea to produce a telescope mirror, it was uh, just to produce a par plain parallel block of glass or something like this and to polish the surface of uh, the optical surface. For this reason, the telescope mirror is very heavy. The Russian six meter telescope at the Caucasus mountains weighs 42 tons. Could you imagine? It's six meter, but uh, the uh, mirrors of two so-called Magellan telescopes at Las Campanas American Observatory in Chile. They are six and a half meters and the weight is 10 tons. It makes difference. And so of course it's a matter of new technology. Yes, we are all looking forward to new technologies in space. I'm yes. personally very curious about uh, the upcoming uh, liftoff of uh, uh, the James Webb Telescope, uh, fingers yeah. crossed. And Jacko, uh, it was incredible pleasure to have you here. Uh, that was the last lecture of our conference. And mm -hmm. uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to uh, go to the part where we will be uh, awarding our posters. Mm -hmm. uh, so Jacko, once again, thank you very much uh, for your support yeah. for our first astrobiologist a uh, conference uh, organized by our society uh, as a representative of Astronomer Society. Mm -hmm. So thank you. All right. Okay, everyone. So now it is the time uh, to uh, announce the winners of the poster sessions. And uh, I know we have uh, some graphics prepared for that. And uh, yes, so the award of the audience uh, goes to Beata Sushticka. There were, there was the, the big, the highest number of voters. Uh, so congratulations. And uh, now I'm going to go to the awards that were, uh, the, the posters that were selected by the committee, uh, starting from the third place. Uh, so the third place goes to Veronika Ederman, uh, Erdman uh, from University of Adam Mickiewicz. And uh, then Execfo, we have two winners uh, of the first place. Uh, that is Rusha Okoń and Mikołaj Gurba. It is uh, also worth noticing and marking that, that there were two posters that got very high marks. And that's... Uh, for Carlis uh, Denise and uh, Marina Fernandez Rus. So congratulations for all the winners and we will be sending the certificates for you. Uh, so thank you very much for attending. Thank you everyone who looked at the posters. Uh, I hope you all had a great time during our conference and uh, that you learned something and you connected with other researchers and I want to thank uh, our patronage for honorary patronage uh, to Polsa, so Polish Space Agency. Also, great thanks to our media patronage, uh, Astronet, uh, Space24, uh, and Cosmonauta.net. And also, yeah, also Astronomia24. Uh, thank you very much for all the organizers and every. I know there was a lot of work in the background. Uh, we managed to uh, solve every upcoming issue. And I hope you all enjoyed how smoothly this conference went. And uh, I'd like to invite you for 
uh, the conference for the same conference that will held uh, next year, hopefully in person. And in the meanwhile, please follow us on YouTube, Instagram, on Facebook, and uh, we will be uh, casting the recordings from this conference on the YouTube. Uh, it will take us some time, but you will find all the recordings on our channel. So thank you once again. It was a great honor and pleasure, and I am I'm extremely great I'm extremely happy that it all turned out so smoothly and so nice and there were so many people uh, more than 130 people registered so once again thank you again